Okay, so with apologies to those who attended the first talk, there will be some overlap between the two talks. Um, I try to minimize it, but there will be some. So I'm going to talk about this, by now, infamous workshop toward a, an extended synthesis we had at the Lorenz Institute in July uh, last year. So some background, as I already said in my first talk, uh, th there was a feeling, I mean, this started around 1985, that the modern synthesis is essentially incomplete, that uh, large chunks of biology had been left out. I mean, you can uh, discuss at length why this was so. I mean, maybe developmental biologists, embryologists, they were called it, weren't really interested to be part of it. It's not just that, I mean, we, Everybody knows Steve Gould's uh, uh, slogan, the hardening of the synthesis, but th th this is something that happened after the Second World War, and many things went on before, and so it's, it's not probably a matter of a conspiracy where some people decided that other people did, shouldn't be left in, but it's more complicated. But anyway, so it was in incomplete uh, or unfinished, as some um, uh, people uh, said. Uh, very briefly, one could say there are open problems, including macroevolution, which is probably more than just microevolution writ large. Uh, neutral evolution, what's the role of drift? Uh, uh, there is not just natural selection going on, but drift, and how important is it, at which levels? Morphogenesis as part of the... I mean, black boxing, as Victor Hamburger called it, of development, morphogenesis, was not included in the synthesis. Um, as a result, the way development is treated uh, in the synthesis, as the unfolding of a genetic program smacks of preformationism, which we thought we had abandoned uh, a long time ago. And then maybe most importantly, uh, there is the issue of novelty, uh, evolution uh, needs variation to work on, but where does the original variation come from? So the, the standard theory presupposes that enough variation is available. And in fact, this is a, a different talk I have in which I compared um, novelty in biology uh, or its absence in standard treatments, uh, the absence of, a, of an adequate theory of innovation in economics and the complete disregard of scientific discovery in philosophy uh, of science. And there are a number of intriguing parallels between those uh, uh, three, and I hope to do a book on this in the near future. Uh, so here are some of the uh, fields or disciplines that were left out, and this is taken from a Dutch author, Korthoff, who writes these book reviews on his website, and I, he's Dutch, and that's why he misspells physiology, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> so this is from the call uh, for our workshop, how do we make sense conceptually of the astounding advances in biology since the 1940s when the modern synthesis was taking shape? Not only have we witnessed the molecular revolution from the discovery of the structure of DNA to the genomic area, we are also grappling with the increasing feeling as reflected by the proliferation of omics, proteomics, metabolomics, interactomics, phenomics, Levins and Luontins, associatomics, uh, that we just don't have the theoretical and analytical tools necessary to make sense of the diversity and complexity of living organisms. By contrast, in organismal biology, uh, new approaches have opened up new theoretical horizons with new possibilities for integration and expansion in evolutionary theories, such as evolutionary developmental biology, niche construction, epigenetic inheritance, and many more. And for those of you who are not uh, familiar with these, I'll just say a few things about uh, these three uh, new developments. Evo Devo, uh, you, I mean, basically, what, 
how does evolution impact on development in ontogeny and vice versa? So some people call this second thing devo, uh, even so, uh, evo. So here are some of the questions, and as you see, that includes um, also uh, questions that that relate to macroevolution. Uh, niche uh, theory, we've been discussing it at lunch, it's maybe one reason we were late uh, to start, is uh, interesting for a number of reasons and as far as I'm concerned, uh, it, it is important in that it provides a second explanation for adaptation. I mean, traditionally, uh, evolutionists will say natural selection is the only mechanism that can explain adaptation. But if, organ if niche construction is ubiquitous in uh, nature, and it seems to be, uh, so organisms change their environment and make the environment more fit for them, this, this provides a second explanation for uh, adaptation, and so it 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 uh, it cannot be it should not be underestimated, and uh, maybe even more fundamentally, if niche construction uh, allows to do this, one can ask what is the role of scarcity, the so-called Malthusian principle in evolution and there has been a school of evolutionists in the former Soviet Union that that did without the Malthusian principle you know if you travel for days and you meet some uh, conspecific you're probably glad that you can cooperate with her instead of killing trying to kill each other and so I mean I think that as a consequence of Niche construct. In fact, this is an, an idea uh, that that you could do without the, the direct clash nature, red in tooth and claw, by defining ever new niches. This is an idea you find, for instance, in Herbert Simon, who wrote a little book in 1983, Little Noticed Reason in Human Affairs, in which he has a chapter on niche construction. So this coincides with Lewontin's pioneering. Uh, uh, work on that. Uh, and then, you know, if a uh, niche construction, uh, once the beaver dams and so on are, are there, they tend to last. Uh, so th you can also define niche inheritance, which uh, John Odlings me has done, and this was one of the topics discussed at uh, our workshop. And then finally, uh, Instead of accepting the, the central dogma or Weismann's doctrine according to which there is only genetic uh, inheritance, inheritance uh, we've come to realize that there are all sorts of epigenetic inheritance uh, taking uh, place. Uh, and then, of course, culture, especially in humans, adds other dimensions to this. For instance, Eva Jablonka has this... Uh, uh, book Evolution in Four Dimensions, where she discusses uh, these various kinds of uh, information uh, transfer. So, back to our uh, workshop. Um, there were two organizers, there were who are both uh, philosophically inclined biologists. Uh, both working in Evo Devo, and then there were uh, a bunch of uh, other biologists and three uh, philosophers of biology. And as I, as I already suggested this morning, we had this little incident some months before the workshop actually took place. A journalist uh, made a big thing out of this, and she has been writing on, I think she wrote a book about Madeleine Albright, and she wrote about religious sects in the U.S., and for some reason she discovered science, but she continued to use these methods of an investigative journalist, so there was this thing, that they are doing something 
in a secret alpine resort, she wrote at one <laughs> point. Now, if you've been to Altenburg, you know that the landscape is rather flat there. But um, <laughs> Anyway, so compare this to, to Woodstock, and it would be more important than uh, Woodstock and blah, blah. And the, the, my, the thing is that then some weeks later she was saying, the, this, I mean, we have two or three of these workshops every uh, year, and they are closed meetings because, I mean, they're not conferences or congress, they are workshops. The idea is to get a book out of them. And our library where we keep, have these meetings is rather small, so we can, we can admit some people to sit in, but not... And, and so she was writing that the people, the people have a right to know what is going on there. After <laughs> all, uh, science is supported by the taxpayers' money, which is not true in our case because we're a <laughs> private foundation. And so, and so then journalists from the New York Times and so on, they all wanted to attend. And students were calling me and saying, can I put my tent in the... In the uh, can I attend the Woodstock of Evolution? And, and so on and so on. And so you cannot stop these things. Uh, anyway, so then... Uh, so in, on the day the workshop started, there was an, uh, a, the coverage in, in uh, the magazine Science, that's also interesting, that uh, a report on a workshop that has not taken place yet, where this serious journalist, uh, Ben Easy, uh, refers to that uh, posting by Mazur and starts by saying that one of the organizers, uh, Massimo Pellucci, is no Jimi Hendrix, uh, and, and so on, and of course, then we, we ourselves, picked up on this, and this was one of the <laughs> of the uh, posters that, uh, that we had at the meeting. So, anyway, what does a philosopher do in all this? And here I'm going to repeat myself. It's not obvious uh, uh, today what a philosopher of biology, in my case. Uh, uh, should do, it's probably should do something that is relevant to the scientists uh, and not just navel uh, uh, staring. So what does, what does that mean in the case of the modern synthesis? And so the first thing I did was to uh, step back and look in a bit in detail what went on through, uh, went through this period in the late 30s, early 40s, referred to as the making of the modern synthesis. Now, the modern synthesis has been hailed as an historical event that appeared to fulfill a project as deep as the Enlightenment, or deeper still, of unifying the branches of knowledge, or the emergence, unification, and maturation of the central science of life, biology, within the positivist ordering of knowledge. The emergence of the central unifying discipline of evolutionary biology, complete with textbooks, rituals, problems, a discursive community, and a collective historical memory to delineate its boundaries. This is a historian of biology, Betty Smokovides. And this is not enough yet. Sustained by a linkage, this refers mostly to Julian Huxley's book, The Modern Synthesis, 1942. Sustained by a linkage of the autonomous disciplines of knowledge, the proper systematic study of man, his origins and location within a progressive cosmological scheme became co-joint and reducible through logic to the mechanistic and materialist frameworks of the physical sciences. What effectively emerged was an evolutionary worldview, a cosmology, and a poetic Weltanschauung, fulfilling an intellectual project that began with the very origins of the narrative of science in Western culture. That's a whole lot. And so my question was, uh, what, what can a, an extended synthesis of, or as some people would say, a post-Darwinian synthesis be in an allegedly postmodern uh, uh, era. So I won't spend much time on the synthesis, uh, are the architects of the synthesis uh, themselves, except to say that, um, well, we can, we can say there are two, two important things happened in the, roughly in the 1920s. Fisher, Haldane, right, and this is the better known part of the story, uh, 
figured out a way to reconcile a specific read reading of Mendelian uh, genetics with a specific interpretation of Darwinian evolution by natural selection and and their models, although quite uh, different, uh, somehow suggested a way to 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 go. And uh, more or less independently of uh, this, uh, we had the the so-called golden age of theoretical ecology with uh, uh, Lotka Volterra and so on. But that was not really integrated into. Uh, into the synthesis. Then in 1937, uh, Dobzhansky uh, published a book in which, by using uh, very efficient uh, rhetoric, I'll return to that in a minute, convinced the classical naturalists that what the geneticists were doing uh, was relevant to them, that they were not just doing artificial things, that, that you know, it had some uh, morals for what we can learn from nature and reciprocally the geneticists were convinced that naturalists were not a, a species soon to go extinct but that you can learn something from their methods. Dobzhansky himself was Russian and uh, he came from a tradition that combined experimental work with model organisms, not just Drosophila, but for instance in Russia they used silkworms as a model organism, and, uh, and uh, field work. Okay. Um, one thing I thought <coughs> was uh, useful to do for a philosopher participating in this Woodstock was to look into the history and the, the, trans, the transformation of the meaning of the very uh, concept of evolution itself. Uh, if uh, you read Peter Bowler, one histo historian of uh, biology, you get the impression that Darwin uh, was so happy to hit upon the, the right interpretation uh, of what uh, evolution is, and I like to contrast this with the work of another historian of biology, Bob Richards, University of Chicago, who in several books uh, has gone back in time to pre-Darwinian pre uh, biology and uh, and also displaced the, the debate. Look, look, look mostly at German developments, but German developments, especially in more theoretical biology, were often influenced again by Russian developments. And uh, so what you see there is that evolution, and this is a, a, a phenomenon that continues to this day, in, especially in, in Russian mm. biology, is much more intimately linked to embryology, developmental biology, than uh, than people in the modern synthesis tradition uh, do. And the second thing uh, I, I learned is that you, as, a, as a philosopher you have a tendency to focus on theories and see theories as the re only relevant unit of analysis and the theory and theory change. There's a lot more uh, involved. Uh, this morning I discussed a bit uh, uh, the unifying and disunifying uh, consequences of the use of certain tools of experimentation, instrumentation. Uh, but what also was crucial in, in, uh, in the context of the, the making of the modern synthesis was the use of rhetoric. And so I, would, I can highly recommend this book by Lia Cecciarelli, um, analyzing and comparing the rhetoric used by Dobzhansky, Schrödinger in uh, What is Life, and E.O. Wilson first uh, in his uh, sociobiological books and then later on in Consilience. In um, uh, sociobiology, he wants basically to extend evolutionary, he wants evolutionary biology under the label sociobiology to engulf the social sciences. And he has this, uh, actually this drawing where you see sociobiology and neuroscience as an amoeba, you know, so, uh, engulfing 
social science in um, consilience, he goes a step further and thinks that uh, the whole of the humanities sh should also be, everything should basically become sociobiology. Uh, now the fascinating thing about this book is, uh, well first of all you, uh, you see how Dobzhansky proceeded, how he uh, had a main story for his main uh, audience, the geneticists, but a hidden second story for the naturalist and that kind of thing. So she, she analyzes in detail the rhetorical strategies, uh, Dobzhansky, but also these two others, Hugh Schrödinger was trying to uh, convince physicists to move into biology and to convince biologists that they shouldn't perceive this movement as a threat, that they would not lose their jobs, or at least not immediately. Uh, and uh, so both Obzhansky and Schroeder were highly successful. Uh, E.O. Wilson failed miserably in terms of uh, the, the rhetoric he used. And uh, again, as I already said this morning, the nice thing is that uh, in this book there's an appendix in which Charelli shows which rhetoric Wilson should have used in order to be uh, successful. Now one thing that uh, reading, going through all this historical literature struck me in particular was that uh, the evolutionary synthesis, as, as I would put it, had no core, has no core. I was looking for an exemplar of synthesis and I thought this, you have to look to organic chemistry where they make these incredibly complicated compounds. And there they say the art of total synthesis as they call it nowadays. It, I mean it's a science but it is also an art, it's a craftsman. Uh, and if you look at the architectures, I don't have the illustration here, sorry. Uh, uh, some of these, uh, of these uh, uh, highly complex compounds, they have no core. They have, actually they're hollow inside uh, most of the time. Uh, in contrast, when, as soon as people talk about an intellectual synthesis, they have a tendency to say there must be some... some well, in Lakatos' words, a hard core with a protective belt. They use these sexual <laughs> metaphors. Uh, or at least something that remains, r remains largely unchanged. Uh, I mean, the, the, maybe the belt changes at the, at the rate that can be... But the, there, there's something that must remain unchanged. That's the idea. You find that in Ernst Meyer. You find that in Gould. I mean, people who... Uh, were proud to be population thinkers as long as they were talking about biological evolution, but as soon as they were talking about evolutionary theory, and in particular their own, they were looking for an essence. Now there is no such uh, essence, uh, and uh, as a result it is next to impossible, and that was my negative moral for this book on an extended synthesis, it's impossible to say where the modern synthesis ends and, and where you start something new. Because, uh, I mean, some people have tried to really characterize the modern synthesis in terms of a number of principles. Like Doug uh, Futuma in his Handbook of Evolution has 16 principles. Uh, but then you see people, for instance, people criticizing the modern synthesis, saying here are five tenets that have to be abandoned in the light of recent developments in genetics. But if you try to connect these five to Futuma 16, there is no connection. So basically everybody has their own view of what the synthesis uh, is. And as a consequence, it is, I think, largely uh, subjective matter whether you want to place yourself within the modern synthesis and as it looks today, more than half a century after it was originally formulated or beyond, because it, it, again, as if there is no core, we don't know where the border is either. And so this is pretty 
slippery. <clears throat> I call about, uh, I talk about the dialectics of unity and uh, uh, this unity uh, for the following reason. This is in part, uh, re briefly recapitulate some of the things I said uh, this morning. There has been this rather influential uh, school of people who say we don't want unity of science and it doesn't exist, it's an illusion, it's an ideology and it's good that we don't have unity. Now I don't personally see how you can even make such a claim because I see unification going on around me all the time starting with Newton, and you cannot deny that Maxwell, uh, for instance, unified uh, a few things. Uh, so what you have is, I think, pretty trivially, on one hand, a system that grows more complex, specializes, I mean, that's, that we know from Adam Smith, at least, that if a system grows, that you will have more division of labor and of course this leads to uh, specific jargon and then ensuing problems of communication and so on. So to counteract that there are unifying tendencies and both are going on all the time and philosophers have made the mistake of looking for this purely at the level of theory but there are all these <coughs> other levels. So you can look at fields, again something I already mentioned uh, uh, this morning, a field is taken to be more encompassing than, uh, than a theory. In fact, you could have fields that don't have real theory yet. They have concepts. I think actually in evolutionary biology, uh, the, the role of concepts has been greatly uh, under, underrated. Like, uh, if you think of the present people, including myself, are talking a lot about modularity. And then modularity gets linked to evolvability, for instance. Now these concepts have a tendency to drag a number of other things, uh, to attract other notions. And so I think what, what you see happening is often uh, a, a displacements in discourse that, that have to do with the, the, the giving more importance to a certain concept. And it's not clear how this is really changing uh, the theory. So basically a field uh, is, is developed around a one or more uh, central problems and then you have expectations as to how uh, the problem or problems could be solved, you have methods, techniques, uh, explanatory strategies, and so on. In the case of an interfield, you look for the solution of your problem elsewhere. You look for it outside of the field. And so you can have, like in the case of Evo Devo I mentioned before, you, it can be symmetrical. Evolution can look at development and vice versa, but it doesn't have to be symmetrical. It could be one way borrowing. And in particular, if I go back to the modern synthesis, uh, as soon as you have a vertical organization in terms of levels uh, of reality, you will probably have asymmetry. So it is probably a uh, uh, higher level fields that will depend more and more, as happened in, in the case of the modern synthesis, on population genetics. And then as a result of that population genetics is seen more and more as the core of the synthesis. Uh, but uh, the analogy to physics would be misleading here in that this population genetics so-called core doesn't do many of the things that you would expect from fundamental uh, theory in physics. Luontin has a nice article on the limitations of population uh, uh, genetics as, as the so-called center of evolutionary uh, theory. Uh, I already uh, <coughs> mentioned this briefly. Uh, hacking has shown with a number of beautiful examples, mostly from physics, that in the history of science, tools, techniques, methods often 
uh, have played a more important role as unifiers and occasionally as disunifiers as well than, uh, than theory which has been the only focus of biologists and I uh, have tried with these co-authors to analyze some of these uh, techniques and how they were transferred in biological uh, context in this article. Um, game theory seems to me the perfect example of uh, that kind of migration, a method that is developed, in this case a, a mathematical modeling tool, uh, in a certain field, strategic uh, decision making in humans, that is intentional agents, uh, is then used to model um, for instance, animal behavior, and uh, so non-intentional behavior. And now it is also increasingly being used by biochemists to model chemical uh, reactions. So that's definitely not what von Neumann and Morgenstern had in mind when they originally formulated uh, the theory. Uh, again, a recap, you, you, you can, given the failure as most people, not just in biology, but in many other disciplines, would, including physics, would uh, today say the failure of reduction does not necessarily mean that unification must fail. And I think that is the major mistake made by these uh, proponents of disunity. They keep they, they believe that if reduction fails, then unification uh, fails. Emergence is the failure of reduction, and if you have emergence, then you cannot have unification. And what I want to suggest is that there are different forms of unification. Uh, I think we don't have to go through I this. Why, why emergence is thought to be a failure of reduction? Well, that, <coughs> that's just... That, <clears throat> that's just uh, an historical contingency. I mean, the, from the 1920s on, you had this uh, reflection in logical positivism mostly, but not only. Even phenomenologists and others worked on, on, uh, on this unity idea. Uh, but so they were looking for a positive formulation of a reduction program. And then re uh, emergence is... Maybe, maybe, if, but if when reduction fails, maybe this is because you are facing a genuine case of emergence. But there was no attempt whatsoever until very recently to look at emergence for itself and try to give it a positive characterization. So that is not related to this failure uh, of reduction. Okay. Um, I... I don't want to repeat these things. I've gone through this uh, morning, but I will, I will go back to the <coughs> to the uh, results we reached at uh, at this workshop. I would say, and uh, this is maybe a bit overly simple, simplistic. I, I see basically three things happening in in post synthesis evolutionary biology. Uh, first, you have, despite the uh, failure of E.O. Wilson's original sociobiology program, nobody nowadays still uses the label sociobiology for their own work. As well. There may be some, but, but, but people are not talking, talking about, for instance, evolutionary uh, psychology, oh, here is this picture of the, the amoeba engulfing mm. its prey. Um, there has been, before evolutionary uh, psychology came to the fore, there, there has been this uh, thing called bioeconomics. Uh, they have their own journal. Uh, it was started in 1999. I don't think it's, it's very successful. Uh, but but uh, fundamentally, the, the idea is an interesting one. If you take the adaptationist and gene-centered view of evolution, uh, you can ask, what is the fundamental difference between evolutionary biology and economics? 
And so these bioeconomics are basically saying, were basically saying, because their major writings were in the 1970s and early 80s, biology, evolutionary biology at least, and economics should be one and the same science because they, have, they, they are about the efficient use of resources. How much can you squeeze out of your uh, resources? Um, so bioeconomics and then, of course, evolutionary psychology and now increasingly evolutionary medicine and someone like Dawkins uh, likes to talk about universal Darwinism and this, this, this is becoming a kind of ersatz religion for, for some people, obviously. Actually, I have this idea, but I haven't been able to substantiate it, but many people who were Marxists in the late 60s and 70s have turned to evolution after their dreams collapsed and so forth. So they, they, they've distanced themselves from society where you cannot get the kinds of change you want anyway and now look at nature. You know. uh, so anyway, so, so I see this w one trend that a, a very narrow view of evolution by natural selection as adaptationist and gene determinist uh, through the writings of someone like uh, Dawkins who sells literally millions and millions of books uh, this, this is having a, a, a substantial impact on Western culture. Uh, then there is evolutionary developmental biology, niche construction theory, uh, maybe to a lesser extent, in, uh, extent this uh, work on uh, inheritance systems beyond the genetic, I think this mostly fits the, the modern synthesis framework. And if you, 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 know, you can either say, uh, if you're politically clever, you would say, for instance, evolvability, that's not a challenge to the modern synthesis. It is something that simply did not play a role when, uh, when the synthesis was forged. It, it wasn't around. So now we have these new things like modularity, evolvability, and they will fall into place within the synthesis. Or you can say, if you want to be original, the synthesis is too limited, so we have to, to go beyond it and with all these things. But I don't see any, any fundamental differences there. But there is a third development, which for me is, uh, I mean, this is something that, that, that m makes me worry and I've had some sleepless <laughs> nights uh, because of this. Um, if you look at systems biology, for instance, there was a, uh, a book recently on the philosophical foundations of uh, systems biology written by mostly Dutch uh, people who had a big meeting on this. Uh, and they, Bogert uh, and others, uh, they claim that it is possible in systems biology to mechanistically understand the emergence of systemic behavior, and they're talking mostly at the cell level, from the properties of molecules disregarding history. So they explicitly discard evolution. Or in, in, sometimes they say provisionally we have to exclude it, but what they really want is to exclude um, evolution. And at the same time they claim they are after meaning. They are going to tell us what the meaning, or I mean, to use a more neutral word, uh, function uh, is. And, and this is a, a paradox that I, I just don't understand. If you physicalize biology in the sense of you, you treat, uh, you treat um, 
problems at the cellular level in purely engineering terms, which, which is what they're doing, um, how are you possibly going to find any meaning uh, in this? Uh, so I can imagine, because these, if, if, if you take a look at the second group, people like people doing evil devo, well, there are some hundreds of them around the planet, maybe a few thousands, depends on how you limit it. But if we're talking about systems biologists, and now increasingly also synthetic uh, biology, here we're talking about many thousands <laughs> uh, you know, of, of people. And so I could imagine that um, in maybe 10 years from now, you have these cohorts of systems and synthetic biologists who have no clue who in their education have not heard about the modern synthesis. Uh, I mean, at some, in some places, in Ghent, Belgium, where I studied, the geneticists ask the philosophers to talk about evolution because it is, after all, an ideological subject and not really part of biology. Uh, so that's a totally different view from the modern synthesis is, is the core of, of uh, biology. So uh, maybe for the majority of, of uh, practicing biologists outside organismic biology, evolution will not be an issue anymore in a not so far away future. Uh, one other thing uh, I, I took home from this workshop, if you ask what distinguishes an extended or the extended synthesis we were after from the old modern synthesis, I think the answer is that Evo Devo uh, in particular provides the tools to offer proximate explanations, explanations in terms of proximate as opposed to ultimate causation. You know, roughly, I'd say modern synthesis biology is concerned with ultimate uh, causal explanation and uh, so with the why questions and now you can, you can uh, complement this with, with uh, um, proximate answers to proximate questions. Uh, and then and I'll round off here. I deliberately wanted to keep this second. I see Tony is already uh, falling asleep, so it's, I think it's a good idea. We shouldn't make this as long as the first stop. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, does this, does the, these, uh, do these developments, in particular, um, Evo Devo becoming more prominent, affect population? Uh, uh, thinking and uh, it's interesting. Terry Deacon mentioned Riedel uh, this morning, who was the founder of the Conrad Lorenz Institute, where I'm uh, working. And Riedel had some ideas. Here is a list of his books, which does not include uh, the very last one that was published posthumously. But I have the cover. It's a green one on the right. Uh, which in English translation means the collapse of morphology. <laughs> and um, Riedel, I, I used to discuss this population thinking with him and the idea that if species are, um, if species evolve, they cannot by definition be classes in the logical sense because classes are outside of time and space, they are the platonic uh, entities. And uh, he, he didn't like this too much. He thought there was a lot in the old uh, concept of a type that, that could still do useful work even today. And so he also had this idea that if you uh, look at an organism, uh, you, that's not a blank slate. You have... Uh, eons of evolutionary wisdom. You know exactly what to look for. And you can, especially if you're well-trained as a morphologist, you can, you can see the type. 
And if you want to make drawings of an organism, you don't draw the real specimen that, that is in front of you, but the ideal specimen combining the best parts of, you know. And so uh, I think that with the, with the return of uh, 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 some of these ideas in Evo Devo, we will probably have to reconsider uh, th this radical idea of, of uh, uh, population uh, thinking, or in particular this whole Gieselin idea that, that uh, species have no uh, essences. And there, there is actually already historical and philosophical work going on in that direction. Several people have pointed out that the essentialism Meyer was talking about and criticizing is a myth, that it never existed uh, in, that, uh, in that sense. Uh, then, I guess this is the last question I want to ask uh, here. What would make for a truly post-Darwinian uh, synthesis, as for instance E.O. Wilson announced in 75, he said the future sociobiology would be post-Darwinian. Uh, I would say there we have to go back to the um, interrelations between natural selection that have been almost the exclusive focus of evolutionists and self-organization. And so, I mean, this is just a very schematic uh, uh, overview of possible interrelations uh, between the two. Uh, and for instance, if you take a look at five, self-organization drives evolution, but it's constrained by natural selection. Or six, natural selection is itself a form of self-organization. I think that if the development of uh, evolutionary biology, including Evo Devo, would go in that direction, then at some point you would have to say, this is no longer Darwinian, this is definitely not what, what Darwin had in mind. And maybe this would not cause a stir. I mean, people have given up the, the central dogma and nobody cried fire. You know? I can imagine that this would happen here, that self-organization would become the organized, <laughs> for instance, because we didn't notice. And that, yes, please, yes.